as a point of review, just one thing I had a thought. We're in this series, we're wrapping up eventually someday in, 19, in 2054, I think we'll wrap this uh, series on parables up. Uh, we're walking through the, what it means to remain or to abide in Christ in John 15. And uh, one, as a review, I was watching TV last night, we were watching a show, and uh, one of the characters was in an accident, and they were uh, waiting for help to come. And they were talking with another person that was also in an accident, and they were waiting and waiting and waiting. Of course, the, the rescue came and pulled them out, and everything was good. But as this character was talking to his spouse later, he said, you know, when I was waiting, I never felt so, uh, uh, I never felt so far from home. And it got me thinking that uh, we've all kind of been there when we're going through hard times, or maybe we're traveling or whatever, and something happens, and we feel far from home. And it got me thinking, like, we felt that, and this show kind of, you know, keyed in on that emotion. But do you realize that although we are, uh, our citizenship is not here, right? As Christians, as followers of Christ, we understand that although we live in this country and we live in this world, our ultimate citizenship, our home, is where? Heaven. It is in glory. And, and when we yearn for that day, we echo Paul's sentiment when he speaks of that, you know. But we're not there yet, right? So home is, is that future place where we will be with God forever. The not quite yet, right? But the beautiful part of what this John 15 has been telling us is, or reminding us is, is that we yearn for that future day when everything is, is full and everything is, is fully realized and experienced, but now it's not as if we've left homeless. Because what's the best part about heaven? Okay, I'm asking you guys. What's the best? Respond. What is the best part about heaven? Is it the golden streets? Is it the mansions? No, what is it? It is to be in the presence of the Trinitarian God, in the presence of God himself, right? Amen. Okay, now, remember the past few weeks we've been talking about Jesus has been saying, remain in me even as I remain in you. So whereas we yearn for that future day, we are not that far from home now because the best part of home is has said, I am with you right now. Please remain in me. That's good news, folks, isn't it? Okay, now, so last week we've been walking through John 15, verse 11. Maybe I should turn there too. I think we're going to do a sermon on it. John 15, 11. And in verse 9... This we're going to do. John 15, 11. We'll come to that. So, I heard this this week. I came across this, this simple formula. Are you ready? Simple formula for how, uh, how we should live. You ready? You should do something every day to make someone happy. You should do something every day to make something happy, even if it's only to leave them alone. <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> then I also came across this recipe for how to be unhappy. This is a recipe for how to be unhappy. You ready? <laughs> make little things bother you. Don't just let them make them. <laughs> also, another uh, ingredient to make uh, life unhappy. Always compare yourself to others. This is a guarantee for instant misery. Uh, here's another one. Do not trust or believe people or accept them at anything but their worst and weakest. Impute ulterior motives to them. If you do that, you're going to be miserable. Lose perspective on things and keep it lost. <laughs> do not per put first things first and lastly here's a great ingredient if you want to be unhappy get yourself a good worry yeah. <laughs> what about which you can do you cannot do anything about but worry 
Get yourself a good worry. Sure to be unhappy. And then I came across this little story. A man had just a man had just had his annual checkup and physical exam with his doctor. And so he's waiting for the doctor's initial report. And after a few minutes, the doctor comes in with the charts in hand and says, there is no reason why you cannot live a completely normal and long life as long as you don't try to enjoy it. <laughs> oh, we went to the same doctor. <laughs> So last week we've been continuing our book in John 15 and uh, abiding in Christ. So in verse 9 and 10 and 11 we see a pattern. There is a reality, there is a response, and there is a result. The reality of verse 9 as far as review was what? Verse, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Folks, it doesn't get any better than that. That by simply placing our faith in Jesus Christ, we stand under the blessing and under the love of Christ with the opportunity to remain in that love, even as he loves us. Because he says, now remain in my love. So there's the, there's the reality, if you will, that we are loved by God himself. Verse 10 is, a, is kind of, kind of a, a response that we should have. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. Our response is loving obedience, isn't it? And as we lovingly obey Him and stay and obey His commands, we are reinforcing and strengthening our presence and our remaining in Him and our abiding in Him, right? Which brings us to the result. We'll look at verse 11 where we're going to be today for the next few minutes. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. What a great result. Great result. Okay, John 15. So, verse 11. I have told you this so that my joy, my joy, begs the question, what kind of joy did Jesus have? We see and we understand Jesus um, was oftentimes and rightly and appropriately uh, uh, sorrowful. He wept. He, 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 he mourned. He grieved. He, he hurt. Right? Uh, by the way, all that was prophesied. That the, he would be the suffering servant. The Messiah, the promised one, the rescuer, the redeemer would be a suffering servant. But is that all Jesus had? His joy was a sweet joy. Matthew chapter 3, verse 17 says this. It says, um, this is a, Jesus is baptized by John. And what happens? The heavens open up, and a voice from heaven said, God the Father himself says, This is my son, what? Who am I? Who I am well pleased. Who I approve. Who I am delighted in. Do you see a joy there? That there was a joy between, within the Trinity, between the Father and the Son, just as there was love. There is a joy. I am well pleased with my Son. So Jesus' joy that he experienced from the Father was a sweet joy. Moreover, it's a satisfying joy. Well, look at Matthew, or excuse me, John chapter... Four, verse 32 and following are right around there. Meanwhile, disciples, disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. You guys remember the scene, by the way, for context? Um, Jesus, the disciples had gone off to get something to eat, and Jesus is at the well, and there's a woman at the well, and, and they had this whole conversation, and the and disciples come back, and, and they brought the food, and they're like, eat something, and Jesus is like, no thanks. He says, <coughs> he says, I, he says I said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Doing the will of my Father, the, doing what I'm so here to do, brings joy to my heart, and that is a satisfying joy. And Jesus says, I, let me tell you, there's a whole other dimension, a whole other realm of joy in my life. 
Moreover, it's a sincere, or I would say spontaneous joy. Look at Luke chapter 7. Jesus in great, great form. He says, uh, the Son of Man came eating and drinking. By the way, he's contrasting himself to John the Baptist who came and fasting and didn't. And they're like, it's okay. Son of Man came eating and drinking. And you say, here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Uh, where, where, where was Jesus' first uh, miracle performed? First recorded miracle? You guys remember? Where was it at? A wedding. What was he doing at a wedding? Celebrating the... What God had instituted between man and a woman and so forth, he's, they're celebrating, right? And he's helping the celebration continue. And, and the, the accusation from the, from the, you know, the, the whatever, was, oh, he's a drunkard. But Jesus never got drunk. Oh, he's a gluttony. Jesus didn't eat, go to gluttony, but he celebrated appropriate ways, right? Because he was, had joy in his heart for what God was doing and what he got to be a part of. He was a man of sorrows, and he wept deeply. He suffered immeasurably, but not only that. Do not mistake somberness and seriousness with holiness. Moreover, it's a strengthening joy, and, and oh boy, we should just do a sermon on this one. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. We are author of Hebrews is saying, hey, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. And then he goes on to explain and describe Jesus. Eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the what? Joy. joy. Who for the joy set before him, what? Endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, this verse, I have been hung up on this verse for weeks. For the joy set before him endured the cross. What? Does anyone else find, like, what in the world is joyous about the cross? Not much. But what did Jesus have? He had a joy... That, that was set before him, not just the cross, but what came after the cross, right? And the joy that was there, that he found there, sustained him, strengthened him for enduring the cross. A strengthening joy. So, that's Jesus. He says that my joy, verse 11, I have told you this so that my joy, now here's it gets crazy, guys, may be in you. So just like, remember, that the, just as the Father has loved me, so I love you. Now Jesus is saying, the joy that I have, and, and no doubt, they, uh, well, maybe more easily than us, because they walked with Jesus, they saw the joy. Some, maybe it's Swindoll, someone said, one of the things that we lose is the, is, the, is the mirth of Jesus, the, the laughter of Jesus, the sense of humor of Jesus, the, right? They didn't. They were there. But may, my joy may be in you, and so now we have a shared joy. Just like his love, Jesus shares and gives graciously his joy. One of the many things Christ loves to give is his joy in you, that my joy may be found in you, experienced by you, part of who you are, just as I am part of you, that my joy may be in you too. There is absolute joy found in Christ. Joy truly can be found, joy truly can be experienced, and joy is part and parcel of following Christ. Isn't this what Peter says? And Peter experienced, by the way, uh, I never had this in my notes, but remember Peter? Post-resurrection, Jesus has risen from the dead and Peter's out fishing and he looks on shore and he sees a guy standing on shore and he sees a guy cooking up some lunch and cooking up some fish and he recognizes him as Jesus. What does Peter do? Slowly row the boat into shore. 
slowly, make sure the nets are all tied up, make sure the fish is secure, make sure, hey, you good, Andrew, we're good, we're good, okay, what's that? No, what does he do? I mean, he barely gets, to, and he just jumps in the water and comes flying to Jesus. That's joy, isn't it? That, that is spontaneous, sincere joy that he sees Jesus to see. Now, what does he say? Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 1. Though you have not seen him, speaking of Jesus, you love him, and even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with what? What kind of joy? Inexpressible joy. Glorious joy. To follow Christ, to remain in Him, is to have access to... To, to Peter says, listen, the, the joy that is inexpressible, I don't even know how to put it into words. I don't even... It's just glorious. Joy. Paul, the Apostle Paul, Philippians 4.4, 4, you guys remember this one, what's it say? Rejoice in the Lord always, again I say, rejoice, rejoice which is the verb of what? Joy. <laughs> rejoice. Be people of active joy in all things. <coughs> Philippians is called the letter of joy, the epistle of joy. You go through and you start counting up how many times the word joy and rejoice and praise is in there, and you just start, you're going to be circling it all over the text. Paul certainly knew what joy was. R.C. Sproul, I said this a few weeks ago, said this. He says, even if the budget is never balanced, and even, even if the stock market crashes, even if food prices skyrocket, even if my child never recovers from her illness, even if I lose my job, and even if I lose our home, yet still I will pray, rejoice in the God of my salvation. Do you see a strengthened, a strong joy, a strengthening joy? Do you see a, an encouraging joy? Do you see a satisfying joy there? A scroll saying, listen, I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. Then he says, and it goes on, why? That my joy may be, I have told you this, so that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be complete. Your joy may be complete. And this is one of those phrases that it's like, as I'm reading, I'm like, yeah, I know what that means. But then I start to think, okay, how do I explain what that means? Okay, so sorry, what, is, what does complete joy look like? I think it's easier to understand what he's saying here as we look at the opposite. What's incomplete joy look like? Incomplete joy is fleeting. Incomplete joy is something that is muddled or muddied by something else, something like worry or envy or greed. Right? Is that, is, would that be fair? All too often, our joy is incomplete, isn't it? Our joy doesn't give the strength we, re we need. Our joy isn't satisfying. Our joy isn't, you get the idea. Because oftentimes our joy is based on something other than Christ. We're looking for joy, or love, in all the wrong places. Sorry, I won't start singing. All too often our joy is based on our performance, our joy is based on the approval of someone else. Yes. But what if? What if the full, complete joy of Christ, the inexpressible joy, was ours? See, to me, I began to think, what would that joy look like? I think, and so then I started to put it back in the text. Remember some of those keys we talked about, about some of the keys of remaining and abiding in Christ? First off, we need to know who God is. And Jesus is, I am the true vine and my Father is the gardener. Do we have joy in who God is? And then it goes on to say that, 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 that the Father prunes us. 
Do we have joy in his pruning? See, there it is, right? Because when he's pruning us, as we talked about it, we recognize that his pruning is, is, a, is an act of a caring and loving God. And then now I can rejoice in his pruning because I'm recognizing what, that he's doing something good. I don't have to like it. I'm not saying, oh, bring me more, bring me more. No, 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 no. It is an honest, like, this hurts. And I don't want to hurt, but I certainly don't want to pull away from it because if this is from you, God, it's going to bring more fruit. And we can find joy in the pruning and the discipline of God. What else? There's joy in His Word. The key to His Word is that you remain in His Word and you obey His Word. We, you have all experienced opening up Scripture and studying it and systematically studying it and studying it, reading it regularly to find it feeding you. And then you're like, wow, this is incredible. There's a joy in His Word, isn't there? Prayer. We talked about prayer being a key. He talks about prayer in this passage. Ask of me and I will joy in prayer. Sweet prayer. To know that the God of the universe is, is listening to you and to me. And to know that I can express my, my pain and my sorrow and my rejoicing and my praise and I can... There's joy. There's joy in obedience. There's joy in obedience to our Lord and Savior, isn't there? A joy that allows us to put our head down at night and sleep peacefully. Because by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit we've talked about, we've walked in obedience to Him. Not that we're earning any brownie points, but we're just bringing glory to Him. There's joy there, isn't there? Certainly there's joy in his love. Certainly there's joy. To the, the love that he offers and gives us and has shown to us on the cross that he brings can bring nothing but joy. And so as this, all these keys point to, the whole point of the passage is to remain in Christ. As we remain in him, Jesus is saying, you will have my joy. Moreover, their complete and full joy permeates every other every area of our life, doesn't it? Joy in our homes, joy in our marriages, joy in our, in our, in our families, joy in our workplaces, joy in our neighborhoods, joy in our church and ministries, joy with our neighbors, and joy, you get the idea. Because we have the joy of Christ. We're experiencing a joy that is amply supplied for the whole of our lives. Let me come at it the other way. Could it be that if we do not have joy, it is indicating that we are, we are not abiding in Christ? Could it be that if we find ourselves in a place where, let's face it, we're not, being, we're not very joyful, it could be an indicator that we have pulled away from Christ. That we are not abiding, we're not trusting, we're not, we're not in His Word, we're not making the idea, right? We have, in some way, shape, or form, we've, we've pulled away in fear, we've pulled away in worry, we pulled away in disobedience. We pulled away in the light. But as I was thinking through this, I went back to my opening joke. You can have a long, normal life as long as you don't try to enjoy it. <laughs> See, you apply, many people apply that to Christianity. The contemporary thought. The common thought is if you follow Jesus, if you're a Christian, well then there goes the joy. <laughs> the contemporary common thought is that if you follow Jesus, there's no more joy, no more fun, no more check it out, it's all done, right? The irony is he, he's the one that gives <laughs> full, complete joy. joy. And everything else is incomplete. The tragedy is, 
is that you look at a lot of Christians and they are more miserable than those who don't have Christ. You see the tragedy, folks? And let me tell you, if you ever find yourself doing a sermon on joy, <laughs> then you realize, I'm not very joyful right now. <laughs> so, but the tragedy is, we, the ones who should be the most joyous, are all too often, you look at us and we are like, what happened? <coughs> we are angry all the time, seemingly angry at everything, only able to see what is wrong with everything and everyone, unable to see a mighty God still at work, unable to see and abide in the love of Christ and the joy of bringing. There's a misrepresentation of this uh, joy in Christian thought because oftentimes we, we present Christianity as only somberness because we have confused somberness with holiness. We have confused gloom, gloominess with godliness. Anger is always righteous and required. Joy is a weakness. Or a denial of reality. There's nothing to be joyous about. Look around. Watch the news. <laughs> the sea. Did you see the distortion there? Now the truth of it is, the biblical reality is, to abide in Christ is to have the fullness of joy. Peter Tyler rightly states that joy is the surest sign of the presence of God. I'll say that again. Joy is the surest sign of the presence of God in our lives. What's the second fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, right? Francis Schaeffer has rightly said, love is the last apologetic. Francis Schaeffer says, love is the last apologetic, and if I may be so bold, joy is a mighty close second. Take a look around your classrooms. Take a look around. Uh, take a look on social media. Take a look at your store. You go to a restaurant. Take a look around. You see a lot of joy. Take a look at the drivers around you. <laughs> Don't ask anybody about me and yesterday. <laughs> Where's the joy? Folks, if love is the last apologetic, joy is right there with it. Because I want you to imagine that by the power of the Holy Spirit, as we abide in Christ, allowing His joy to saturate our lives, as we walk in humble obedience and love, imagine how radical and how different that would look to the world that is staring at us, saying, you call yourself a Christian. Imagine if they saw the joy of Christ in our lives. Imagine if, if, if imagine we were a people that not only grieve and cry at funerals, but laugh because our loved one who knew Jesus, we understand is in glory. Amen. A people who are quick to laugh at themselves and forgive quickly. Yes. A people who are quick to appropriately celebrate the good in life. People who are generous in praise of others. People who are spontaneous and fun and serious when needed, but at peace and content in Christ. Imagine the people who clearly rejoice in all things, giving praise to God of our salvation. What kind of witness would that be? I think it would be pretty powerful. As a closing prayer, Heavenly Father, oh, that we would be a people who remain in Christ. That we prayerfully, dependently, faithfully, obediently be a people who abide in Christ even as he abides in us. That we would be a people who remain in Christ and experience his joy. His sweet, satisfying, sincere, strengthening joy more and more each day. And by your grace and your power, God, may we be a people who are quick to laugh 
and rejoice in who you are and what you have done and are doing in our lives and those around us and even in the hard things. May be a people who rejoice in the fruit you are producing in us and through us for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.